Let's take a second and talk about um, our sponsor, fastgrowingtrees.com. Uh, as I've, I've, I've talked about before, uh, during the pandemic, my wife took all of her gardening, landscaping stuff to the next level. The place looks amazing. You've probably seen our hydrangeas and some of my dog videos with Pippa. And um, so she, we were really excited to give Fast Growing Trees um, a try. And we got an avocado tree and we are very excited about it. Uh, my wife has nothing but great things to say about her experience dealing with them. I, I'm not pawning all of this off on my wife um, to avoid responsibility or anything. It's just that she's the one who really cares about all of this stuff and her word matters more than mine does. She even knows how to make stuff grow in Alaska, so she would trust her. She knows what she's talking about. With FastGrowingTrees.com, you can skip the big box stores and just go straight online. They got great customer service. It's really easy to use. It's a, simply a better way to buy trees, shrubs, and plants without having to leave your house. There's no more waiting in lines. There are no more messy cars. You know, the thing falls over and you get the potting soil all over your, the back of your car, or maybe you take your dog with you and it starts schnurfling around with a schnozzleator before you even get the thing home. You can go to fastgrowingtrees.com and choose from thousands of varieties of trees, shrubs, and plants expertly curated to thrive in your area and delivered to your door in just one or two days. Whether you're looking for shade, privacy, fruit trees, or just added color for your yard, every plant is shipped with a well-developed root system ready to explode with new growth. Planting season is here. Join over 1 million satisfied gardeners at fastgrowingtrees.com plus the 30-day alive and thrive guarantee means your plants will arrive happy, healthy, and ready for planting. So now through July 31st, go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash remnant for 15% off. That's 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash remnant. Fastgrowingtrees.com slash remnant. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I please have your attention? Daniel Digger! Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by The Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, go to thedispatch.com uh, to uh, get your turn at striking the piñata of goodness. And... Um, Today we have a, a first timer, so he's at least uh, he's at least four more appearances on the remnant before he gets his gold jacket. Um, I should also say, as a matter of of institutional and, and tribal pride, he is from the hated Brookings Institution. Um, <laughs> and uh, although you know we had Elaine K. Mark on recently, and we love Elaine K. Mark, so one day I will solve the cognitive dissonance and stop saying terrible things about Brookings. But having started as a policy gnome at AEI almost 30 years ago, um, one of the first things they beat into you is um, Brookings Delenda Est, um, at least when it comes to softball. And I would be remiss if I didn't keep that up. Um, our guest today is uh, 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 Shadi Hamid. Um, he's at the, he's a senior fellow at the center for Middle East policy and the author of several books, including Islamic Exceptionalism, How the Struggle Over Islam is Reshaping the World. He writes for The Atlantic, a lot about religion generally, and he is uh, the host, co-host of the Wisdom of Crowds podcast, which is uh, burning up the digital airwaves um, everywhere. Uh, Shadi, thanks so much for, um, for, for, for coming on The Remnant. Really appreciate it. Hi, Jonah. Thanks for having me. Um. So my understanding is that people at Brookings like candy for the sweet, sweet taste. No, anyway, uh, we don't need to get into that. Um, so, uh, well, there is wrote, a softball you... rivalry that that I hear about, right, between yes, us goes... and AEI. So that that's gone back many decades, um, from what I hear. Oh, it goes. It stretches back to the before times. I mean, I think it was a. <laughs> uh, it was originally a blood sport thing, and it's one of the great things about modernity, right? Is it 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 replaces uh bloody combat with 
symbolic comeback and ritual. And so instead of us killing each other, we just play softball. So, um, <laughs> and every now and then we, we tore the paper, the trees in front of Brookings, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, so you, uh, you, you've been writing a bunch about the decline of religion, um, in, in America, you wrote a big piece about it in the Atlantic not long ago. And then there are these new numbers that apparently have come out that it's, it's even more pronounced. Um, why don't you sort of explain how you see this, you know, the state of organized religion in America right now, and maybe sort of walk us through a theory about why it's happening. Well, sure. Well, first of all, it's a remarkable drop. And every time I look at the numbers, I have trouble processing them. But basically from around 1937 until 1999, give or take, church membership in the U.S. was hovering around 70%. So despite the cultural and sexual revolution of the 60s and everything that was going on, civil rights struggle, it still stayed more or less at the, at this, at the same percentage. But then we see something starting around the early 2000s where it's a quite precipitous drop. So where it was 170%, it has dropped below 50% for the first time since Gallup was, has been recording these numbers. So that drop has happened in just about 20 years. And that's church membership. And some people might say, well, uh, church membership isn't the best proxy for religiosity because one can, of course, be a Christian without being a member of a church. So it just might be an issue of institutional Christianity declining. But if we look at some other numbers uh, from Gallup, but also Pew and elsewhere, um, so for example, um, in 2020, only 48% of Americans say that religion is very or extremely important in their daily lives, and that's dropped significantly as well. Um, about 20 years ago, it was around 60%. So maybe not as, not as big of a drop, but still. And then we have the rise of the so-called nuns, not nuns who, who wear the habits, but um, not nuns like people who don't have a religion. And that includes atheists, agnostics, and people who are vaguely spiritual, but not particularly religious or don't identify with a specific religion. And that number has gone up to a quarter of the population so there's something very striking happening, and it's quite recent, and where we used to be as Americans uniquely devout among Western democracies, and we were the holdouts because throughout the uh, Western Europe, um, religion cratered um, to the extent that, um, you know, in some ways there are more practice, almost more practicing Muslims in France than there are practicing Catholics, which is remarkable considering that. Muslims are only about seven or eight percent of the population there. But anyway, we're converging, we're moving more in the direction of Western Europe. We probably won't get to that level because they're just so low when it comes to various measures of religiosity. But the trend line is quite clear. So there's a number of interesting questions. I mean, the first one, which I discuss at some length in my Atlantic article, um, America Without God, is that um, this, you know, we secularists might have thought that this was a good thing because you know secularists and and liberal elites if we want to call them that are always saying that uh conservative or strict or orthodox religion uh has a polarizing effect it tears us apart it's divisive so on and so forth and as more and more americans move away from that we'll have a more rational reasonable sensible politics but i think what we've seen in recent years is that ideological intensity and fragmentation has actually risen. So for, you know, for me, it's sort of this question of, um, well, be care, you know, be, should we want this? Be careful what you wish for, because with Christianity declining, other things end up taking its place. I'm someone who sees Americans as, and we're, we're a nation of believers because we have something called the American idea. We have an American faith which has been tied in various ways to a common Christian culture. So, uh, and we don't have the kind of shared ethnicity and, and kind of ethnic, the centrality of ethno-nationalism that many European countries have. So for example, um, to be German is an accident of birth. It's hard to become German. Um, we can say the same for Sweden or the Netherlands. So 
we are different and we are, I would argue, exceptional. And that presents a problem for us because if we are a nation of believers, then we have to believe in something. And I think what we're moving towards now, which is, first of all, on the right, a kind of weird Trumpism, ethno-nationalism, not necessarily better than Christian conservatism, and on the left, wokeism, which I've been an outspoken critic of. So we have these developments that I'm very concerned about. And I, and just the last thing I'll say on this is I'm in the odd position of, I'm, I mean, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe Christianity is true from a creedal perspective. I'm Muslim and I'm quite open about that. So I'm in the odd position of almost, uh, if you will, longing for Christ for more Americans to rediscover Christianity or to be more Christian, even though I don't believe in Christianity myself. Yeah, I mean, uh, I am just to level set, essentially a Chestertonian secular Jew, and um, I, I. Definitely, I mean, I'm sort of with Irving Crystal on this, where he, you know, famously said, you know, I, I don't want to badmouth, make it sound worse than it sounds, but his basic position could be characterized: uh, belief in God is less important than faith in religion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I tend to come from the point of view that I, I agree with you that this idea that somehow you can just remove religion and not fill that void in people's lives and in society with something else that substitutes as religion. There's just no evidence of that in history. And I'm a big fan of, you know, you know, the historian, Michael Burley, you know, he does hmm. a lot of, the, Oh yeah. He, he's done several books, um, tracing how basically the wars for religion never ended in Europe. They were just substituted with politics. And I know that the philosopher, Eric Vigelin kind of, or Vogelin, I can never, whatever way I pronounce it, people give me grief. But, you know, he was the author of this <laughs> concept of political religions. And, you know, and he made the, the, the case that, that Nazism was explicitly a political religion, that communism was a political religion, that when you remove traditional religion in the Chestertonian sense, it's not that people won't believe anything. It's, it's not that people will believe nothing. It's that they'll believe anything. And, so I'm very much with you that I think wokeism serves as religion. I think nationalism has always historically served as a, as a religion. And this kind of bothers people, I think, because they, th because there's less appreciation than there should be for the fact that, you know, as, as the political philosopher and, 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 and theologian, Will Herberg put it, we are, he used to call us homo religio in the sense that hmm. we are just the species that believes in religion and we need, we have a religious instinct. I think Jonathan Haidt is absolutely right about this stuff. And it's not hard for politics to invade religious thinking. It's actually remarkably easy, which is why you actually need good dogma to be vigilant against that happening. And, um, and so I very much worry about what's going to happen to a, 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 an unchurched America to me is a much scarier America for all the faults that you can ascribe to organized religion, um, than a churched America. And, and, uh, it worries me greatly because at least organize, you know, at least Islam and Judaism and Catholicism and most of the forms of Protestantism, they have rules. They have guardrails about where you can get off track. If you don't even know that your political ideology is in fact, your religion, the, the, Opportunity for motivated reasoning and confirmation bias is enormous, and lots of things can go off the rails. Um, so when you write about this, uh, what is like, and you know, I, I know what the the woke crowds think of me. How angry do the woke people get with you <laughs> when you write this? And <laughs> what would you say is 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 there better pushback about this? You know, you always get. A lot of criticism whenever you write anything serious and some of the criticism is really stupid, but some of it's actually really interesting and smart, even if you disagree with it. So like, where do you, where do you think you have the weakest points in your position? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you have a great sense of where I am on the political or ideological spectrum and only because I think a lot of people, even people who know me sometimes get a little bit confused 
I, I mean, I, do, I am, I do consider myself to be on the left side of the spectrum. Um, I mean, this might sound weird and it's a complicated story, but I did support Bernie in the, in the primaries, which is mm-hmm. like some people find really bizarre. But anyway, um, I think that, you know, as someone who was on the left side of the spectrum, and I would say that I'm a classical liberal, but one who is skeptical of aspects of what liberalism has become. Um, so I'm a critic of liberalism, but sort of from within the liberal faith, if you will. Sure. But I would say that um, the, the the woke folks or whatever we'd like to call them t- tend to get extremely... It's been tough, I have to say, like the past, um, uh, you know, seven or eight months, especially when the um, the protests were starting in the summer and where some of the woke discourse became more prominent and it started to center at least the social media conversation. I think there was a lot of anger towards me because I was coming from within their own tribe and the fact that I'm a person of color and I'm part of a, I guess, a disadvantaged minority. I think there was a sense of like, Shaddy, wait a second. Why are you doing this? You're brown. Why are you betraying your people? Or why aren't you representing your group the way that you should? And I think what I've noticed is that I think a lot of this is an intra-left or intra intra-liberal struggle. And, and the people that woke advocates get most angry at are the ones who are they see as a threat they don't look at the right the right is bad whatever but they're not really a threat to the project because they're outside of the fold anyway but then you know you look at people from within and that becomes i think from their perspective a problem so i think that was you know and it, it sort of pushed me to try to rethink how i how i deal with social media um, and I find it to be quite vociferous and quite intolerant, some of the woke discourse. And I think there's an asymmetry as well, because from my standpoint, when I think about an institution or let's say the New York Times or wherever someone might be, I think those of us who are just more normal liberals, I personally am fine with woke people having prominent positions in the New York Times and whatever else institution, and we should be able to coexist. I'm not trying to get them forced out or getting them fired, but I think that they don't necessarily return the favor. They Mm -hmm. see me or people like me as a threat that has to sort of be neutralized. And that makes it hard to kind of fight the not fight maybe isn't the right word, but to kind of engage in debate because I'm an enemy, but I just see them as an opponent or an adversary. I don't think they're evil or whatever. So I guess that's that's what I'd say about that. And um, but I do also have some protection. So a- as angry as they as some of them are that I am a person of color who's criticizing wokeness, I honestly wouldn't be able to say quite a bit of what I say if I was white. I mean, there is some, if you will, privilege mm-hmm. in being brown. I mean, Muslims aren't as Perce- they're not perceived as as disadvantaged as they were like during Trump's Muslim ban and all of that when we were really the focal point of Trump's obsessions. But still, you know, being a Muslim is kind of like, you know, privileged in its disadvantagedness. So I think mm-hmm. that gives me some leeway. It is harder to cancel me, I guess. Um, well, they won't give up. But, but in terms of what they're, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in terms of like the good points, because you bring up, a good question is what are the good points that some of these critics make? You know, I think there is an interesting debate about whether woke, to what extent wokeism is truly comparable to a religion. And obviously you can sort of stretch these concepts too much. Obviously it's not exactly a religion, but I do think it's comparable in, um, when it comes to the desire for excommunication, the, um, the, um, the fact that there are some, I guess, prophets of wokeism, uh, you know, whether it's Foucault or Kendi or whatever it might be. And there are some founding scriptures from some of these critical theorists and so on. Um, and so it has, it has, um, it also has concepts of original sin and what to do to expunge sin. Um, and it has different hierarchies of, of meaning and of people who are better than others. 
But as you sort of alluded to earlier, it's a moving target because there aren't any clear boundaries of what the woke religion is. So it's a constantly moving target. And it's hard for people to actually know what the creed is because you're always having to progress and be more woke than you were two years ago. And we can see how people who, um, you know, on gay marriage or that, that becomes resolved and there's new issues that you have to become uh, progressive on. And then it keeps on going and it's never clear where it quite ends. Um, so I think that makes it, that makes it different than a religion in that you don't have clear boundaries of creed. Um, and that makes it very uncertain for people that they always have to be, you know, watching over their shoulder to make sure that they're not running afoul of whatever the new standards are. Yeah, so I, I think that's right, but I don't think that that, I don't think that that diminishes the case for it to be a religion. It just makes the case that it is less recognizable as what we think of when we think of religion, right? I mean, you think about the the French Revolution, you had a very similar dynamic of sort of revolutionary ardor and always the, the race to be more radical than the next person and the race to find that the near the, the near friend was a greater enemy than the, fo- the far, far foe, right? I mean, this is one of these things yeah. in, in civil wars, People, you know, one of the great cliches that drive me crazy, I wrote about it in one of my books, is this idea that understanding brings peace. And if you look at the greatest rivalries or, or animosities between groups in world history, they're between groups that tend to actually understand each other pretty well. Sunni and Shia understand each other far better than Presbyterians and Shia understand each other, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Israelis and Palestinians know a lot about each other. Um, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean that there aren't misunderstandings, but they, they know certainly more about each other than, than Costa Ricans know about either. And in every civil war, it, it's why they're so intense and ugly is because there actually is a lot of understanding. And you look at like the, the Christian fight, I mean, from, from my perspective or even a modern's perspective, some of the fights between the different denominations of Christian are mind bogglingly, you know, minute. I mean, like the, 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 it's the narcissism of the small differences stuff. And, um, and so I think that like when you were describing how you always have to sort of update your position, that's a very common thing among you know, sort of I- iconoclast or religious zealot movements that haven't spent the time to write everything down and figure out hmm. where the dog, where the dogma is, you know, and that's why I'm a big defender of dogma dogma is you know we live in a culture that says dogma is evil we say we live in a culture where dogma means you're closed-minded and my response whenever i hear that kind of stuff is i say so where do you come down on child rape and they'll say i'm against it and say, i am too that's part of my dogma right dogma is supposed to be those things those those questions that are just closed that you don't address anymore because you're not allowed to address anymore. It's like taboo. There's some really useful taboos in American, in, in life and civilization. Civilization is about the accumulation of dogma and taboo about closing moral questions. We close the question of slavery and whatnot. And I think that the, 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 the stuff about wokeism being a religion that because it doesn't have dogma doesn't mean it's not a religion. It means that it's in the religious zealot mode and Mm. it is, still in the early stages of it, you know, and I could see how wokeism a hundred years from now, if it survives, could be much more moderate and much more reasonable precisely because it's had some trial and error and it wrote some stuff down. But in the early days, you just, you don't know where the, the, where to, where too far is in a way. And it goes too far. And it's the same thing with the nationalism stuff. I I think that's right. Um, Now I feel like if wokeism moderates, then it would just become, something normal that a lot of us, I mean, I, you know, I just being for myself, I mean, I, I support or supported the basic um, thrust of the racial justice protests over the summer. I mean, what I find a little bit concerning about wokeism is that it distracts from structural questions. So like whether it's the criminal justice system or sentencing guidelines or actually how to do intelligent police reform, and it refocuses attention on very silly debates around representation, Mm -hmm. um, you know, know, on corporate boards or 
whether you have the right percentage of a race in a particular um, in a particular group, and um, and then silly, st- really absurd stuff that we see in some you know levels of schooling, and it's a big issue in California and other places where they're expunging, they're just trying to indoctrinate people in things that are very contentious. There isn't agreement on those things, so on and so forth. And I feel like a lot of that is a distraction from, like, if you really want to address racial justice, um, you know, you you shouldn't be so focused on um, whether some corporate board, you know, is focused on being more woke and saying the right things and canceling people who aren't towing the line, so on and so forth. So I think it's also, it undermines its own cause. It's ostensibly meant to support certain minorities, but it doesn't actually do that very effectively. And I think also, um, and I'm not speaking, I'm speaking here about more um, minorities that come from an immigrant background. I think there's also something very patronizing and condescending about woke, woke ideas insofar as they tell immigrants who are coming into this country, many of whom are excited to be American or to become American in the future. And I can't imagine if my parents came and they came, um, uh, my dad in the 70s, my mom in 1980, and if they had come and they were immediately confronted with talk about the evils of America and how America is so racist, they wouldn't even be able to process process it. They'd be like, wait a second, we're coming here because we we like the idea of becoming American. And now you're telling me that, you know, we shouldn't be proud about right. our new country. So from the standpoint of recent immigrants, and I think this is partly why you saw a shift among Hispanics, among, you know, to a lesser extent, black men. Also, interestingly, Muslims, American Muslims, um, and the, the, lar- the largest survey that was done after the election. Um, and so it seems like a pretty large sample size that... Um, uh, as many as 35% of American Muslims supported, voted for Donald Trump in 2020, where the number in 2016 was around 10 to 15%. So we're talking about a massive increase in American Muslim support for Donald Trump, which I think for a lot of people is mind boggling. I mean, why would the person who championed the, 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 the Muslim ban or what was perceived as a Muslim ban um, how would he get that kind of support? So I think it really messes people's racial, and that's why it doesn't make sense to look at something as complicated as American life and American politics through this very narrow lens of which ethnic or religious group you're part of, because um, we are a confusing, complicated country, and that's why I think you know these kinds of paradigms don't actually accord with what happens in real life, and I and you know. I, since I, I've written, writing, been writing more about wokeism and we talk about it on our podcast, my mom listens to our podcast quite religiously herself. And whenever I see her, she's always like, Shadi, like, what is this woke stuff you keep on talking about? Because you explain <laughs> it to me, but it doesn't, she can't really grasp it because when you actually try to explain some of these ideas to someone who isn't inculcated in it, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't sound so intelligent, at least. <laughs> no, no, I hear you. I mean, it's it's funny. It's funny you bring this up. This is one of my pet theories: is that, um, you know, sort of at the big picture level, I, I feel like both parties are determined to be minority parties, um, because they are listening to a very small sliver of hyper ideological, um, negative partisanship driven elites, and that leave big swaths of like normal people, regardless of you're liberal or conservative immigrant or you know whatever just like normal people don't want to hear their country run down um and normal people don't want um to be told that they're they they live in an evil country or they don't want to be told that they're racist they also don't want to be told that um you know uh uh that capitalism is bad and all these kinds of things you can have stuff like i mean when i say capitalism is bad you can be in favor of a generous welfare state and all these kinds of things but people are just generically not as radical in their at in their 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 outlook as the elites of both parties um are trying to make it out to be and the best example of this for me is the latin x thing um mm. where uh you have you know there was public there was some 
a, a progressive polling firm looked into it and found that something like um, uh, only 2% of Hispan American Hispanics use the term Latinx. Um, and something like a third hadn't even heard of it. Most didn't know what it was. Most Hispanics don't even like the word Hispanic. They prefer Mexican American or American or, you know, a Cuban American. They're more proud of their nationality than they are of this sort of very loose ethnic catch-all of, of Hispanic or Latino. And, but if you listen to the democratic primaries, they're all using Latinx. They're all talking in this, this shibboleth rich shorthand for uh, sort of woke and woke adjacent elites. And similarly, I think the, you know, the discrimination against Asian Americans at places like Harvard and um, MIT has nothing to do with anti-Asian bigotry and everything to do with the fact that a lot of the Asian applicant, the Asian applicants are disproportionately the children of either, either, either they're disproportionately immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants. So they tend to have more sort of traditional bourgeois attitudes about going to college to get a good job and not doing mm. social justice missionary work. And so they don't know how to speak the shibboleths that proves that they are plugged into the social justice stuff. And that makes it easier to say, these aren't the, you know, you read some of the stories about this and you hear administrators say, look, we just don't want a school full of like science grinds and that kind of thing. We want well-rounded students. And that's code for these kids don't know how to talk about systemic racism. They know how to talk about calculus because they went to Stuyvesant or whatever, and their parents beat the crap out of them preferably to get great grades. And like, I have a, I have a relative who's, who's Indian American and he had to sign a contract when he was uh, 12 years old with his immigrant parents promising to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and, That's good. And, yeah. So I, mean, I, 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 so I think that one of the things that really ill serves the left or left liberals generally is that the bubble of sort of the MSNBC uh, very online blue check mark Twitter crowd is that they all speak in this language of wokeness that actually does not appeal to your normal liberal democratic voter. You know, one of the most life changing things in politics of the last half century is that African American Democrats are now more conservative than white liberals. I mean, it's like the, and that changes sort of everything. And, and so I think that 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 you get this problem on the on the Democratic and the liberal side where, you know, it's like MSNBC would have one guest after another talking seriously about defund the police, which works really great at sort of the seminar level. But you talk to you look at the actual polling, even from last summer of where normal black and Hispanic voters were on this issue. And you realize what a fringe weird issue yeah. that is to say let's just get rid of the police that is something that makes enormous sense in a senior level seminar at brown and makes no sense like in east st louis um but uh, i don't know how i got off on this rant but um uh, there we are okay let's take a second and talk about our sponsor um it is no secret that uh the labor market is sizzling right now businesses are struggling to find qualified people and people who have been uh, basically working from home or not working for a long time have a lot of options to choose from. That's why hiring can feel like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Sure, you can post your job to some job board, but then all you can do is hope the right person comes along, which is why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash dingo. When you post a job on ZipRecruiter, it gets sent out to over 100 job sites with one click. Then ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job and actively invites them to apply. In fact, ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. It's no wonder that over 2.3 million businesses have come to ZipRecruiter 
for their hiring needs. So while other companies overwhelm you with way too many options, ZipRecruiter finds you what you're looking for, the needle in the haystack. And right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this web address, ziprecruiter.com slash dingo. Once again, remember to go to this unique address, ziprecruiter.com slash D-I-N-G-O. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Let's take a second and talk about our sponsor today, HelloFresh. I use HelloFresh. I like HelloFresh. It is a great sort of backup um, if you're a busy person who didn't have time to think about dinner but wants to make something good with your family. It's also just good to, uh, to, to sort of not have to think about stuff for one, one night or two nights of the week. Um, we use it a bunch. We really enjoy it. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or less. Try HelloFresh's quick and easy meals. They're 15 to 20 minute dinners, breakfast on the go, and more easy options. Perfect for your busy lifestyle. With 50 menu and market items each week, including ready-to-eat salads, sandwiches, and soups, there's something for everyone to enjoy. HelloFresh's recipes are designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure deliciousness and simplicity. And their high-quality fresh ingredients are sourced directly from growers and delivered to your front door in under a week. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Remnant14 and use code Remnant14. Why Remnant14? For up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Remnant14 and the code Remnant14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. So let's talk for just a second on, um, on the sort of the right, how, how you see the right wing ethno nationalism stuff. I have very, you know, I was very critical yeah. Trump. I don't like nationalism. I hate populism. Um, I am, you know, the, the reason this podcast is called the remnant is it's a reference to Albert J. Nock and the book of Isaiah and how I very comfortable with the idea of I'm out, I'm out of step with where the right is these days. Um, but listeners know where I come down on all that. We're, make your same diagnosis about the the decline in religion infecting or uh, changing the right that you've made about the left. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing you touched on earlier, I mean, so one question is, why haven't American Christians, specifically Christian conservatives, been more vigilant in terms of resisting non-religious ideas, because we are seeing in some quarters uh, this weird fusion of Christian nationalism, which is even taking in sometimes very non-religious ideas like QAnon and whatever else it might be. Um, and I think like one of the tragedies of Christianity today in the U.S. is they lost they lost the culture war in a pretty in pretty decisive fashion and also relatively quickly. And I think the gay marriage debate encapsulated that where it, it shifted um, rapidly. And because of that, I think more and more Christians found themselves in a defensive crouch. Like if you were a white Christian conservative, you, you stopped thinking about how to advance an affirmative agenda and you started thinking more about how to protect whatever you had left. And that helps explain how Donald Trump became an unlikely vessel for the vast majority of white evangelicals. I mean, actually, I mean, early on, um, the more church going you were in the Republican primary in twenty in twenty fifteen, 
or 2016, the more likely you were to support Ted Cruz. It was actually the less right. church going Republicans who gravitated towards Trump. So we did see this interesting dynamic where to be a believing Christian gave you some protection against the temptations of Trump, right? Of course, when Trump became the nominee and that was the choice people had, then it was like, well, at least Trump can protect us from the cultural secular onslaught that is changing or perhaps even ending our way of life. So I think it's a tragedy that Christians became so defensive that they were willing to accept anyone, someone as unchristian and apparently as unbelieving as Donald Trump as their sort of temporal savior. And I think that's also going to have this uh, prolonged effect of turning away more Americans from Christianity, that if you're not, if you're not someone who is into the Trump scene, then that's going to push you away because the two have become more intertwined. If we're talking about whatever it is, 80% of white evangelicals, or even more, perhaps even a bit more than that, voted for Trump this time around, you know, that's obviously going to have an impact on how people perceive conservative Christianity in America. So I think that's part of how I see this development, that dogma is supposed to protect you, and there are supposed to be guardrails in the well-established monotheistic faiths, but politics has a way of changing the context and pushing people in directions they otherwise wouldn't go. And I don't know how you really reverse that. I mean, that's not really for me to say. It's I think it's for it's for I think uh, Christians uh, throughout the U.S. to kind of have an internal conversation about how to get on a stronger footing. But I, I don't think it helps that Democrats have done a pretty bad job of reaching out to Christian conservatives or people who are religiously conservative, but otherwise sympathetic to parts of the Democrats' economic program, for example. And you have you know Catholics and also some evangelicals who would be, I think, in theory, um, interested in this idea of economic and social just, justice and reducing inequality and kind of fitting into the idea that Christians are supposed to help the weakest among us. I mean, there are ways to kind of make those arguments persuasively, but Democrats don't even seem interested in reaching out to those people who maybe voted for Trump reluctantly because they're like, well, abortion and Democrats seem like they have this very explicit litmus test on these issues and we can't really go along with that for moral reasons. So I think it doesn't help that the um, the partisan divide has been overlaid with the religious divide because, you know, you in democracies, you know, you want to have cross cutting cleavages where you don't have too many divides that just kind of overlay on top of each other because that magnifies polarization. There used to be a time when you could find small O Orthodox Christians in both parties, and that allowed us to have something resembling a common Christian culture that even if you weren't Christian yourself, you at least respected the fact that in both major parties, there were people who took Christianity seriously and you were okay with that. But now that we as Democrats have become a thoroughly secularized uh, party, it becomes harder for us to close that gap. So I can sort of understand why, um, obviously the, the black church is a different category um, and you know most black Christians are still firmly in the democratic camp. But when we're talking about white Christians, now that they feel like they, they are in a, that they're a minority, but they also actually are a minority. <laughs> so, right. and that makes it hard to kind of bring them, to bring them over. So I think that's sort of what makes the, the Trumpist ideas more appealing and the ethno-nationalism starts to seep into that. Um, and that's not good news for America, but it's also not good news for Christianity, I would say. Yeah. I mean, the, the, my colleague, David French, uh, you know, he makes this point. We were talking about it earlier on a different podcast this week, actually, that the the most religious, arguably the most religious or the most church attendant group in America, uh, yeah, the black church might actually be more than the evangelical church at this point uh, or in terms of a church attendance and, and religion. And it seems to me that this is one of these weird things where it's very difficult to foresee now. But if you... If you took a step back, you know, it's like I was talking with a friend of mine the other day about how weird it was as, as that he was as a, as a conservative. He was like 
agreeing with Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald about things because what strange bedfellows these times are creating. And you have Elizabeth Warren saying things about, you have Tucker Carlson saying nice things about Elizabeth Warren and all these weird things. You could see as the Republican party, much to my chagrin becomes more of a status, big spending sort of expanded welfare estate, maybe for my coalition, not your coalition kind of BS, but still as that happens, and as the culture war stuff becomes the really only serious dividing line between the parties, you know, like the GOP has nothing to say about debt and deficit anymore. It, the RNC only issued two statements about the Biden uh, uh, $1.9 trillion COVID relief thing. And they all came out, they both came out after the thing passed. They were much more comfortable talking about Dr. Seuss, right? So as, as the only real way to signal your difference from the other party becomes more cultural. That could be a real problem for Democrats. If the, if, if African Americans come to the conclusion, well, I can still get all sorts of stuff for my coalition from the Republican party. Um, but at least they're not dunking on God and religion the way my own party does. And you could also see a lot of the sort of, sort of more secular college educated suburbanite Republicans who don't like culture war stuff, just sliding over into the democratic party. I mean, the, the if you make culture stuff and religion, the only thing that the two parties disagree on, you're going to get sort of like the Pakistan, India border in the late forties. You're just going to get migrants crossing both ways. And the coalitions could look really different in the next 10 to 15 years in ways that, people on your side of the aisle and my side of the aisle both don't like in a lot of ways. And in, in, in some ways that's what's already happened in, in Europe, uh, Western Europe in particular, where you have, everyone agrees on a strong welfare state. Um, no one is really calling for small government. So what ends up happening is that the primary divide in society is around questions of immigration, culture, Islam specifically. And it's, it's remarkable. Right. And this is something that I've, I've written about a bit where um, even, the, even though Muslims are anywhere between 2 to 7% of the population in Western European countries, so substantial, but not like a massive number, what to do about Muslims and what to do about Islam's role in public life becomes, you know, sometimes a number one issue or number two issue in public debates because there isn't a whole lot to argue about on, on economic issues. So you have to find other things. And that's where the differences become more stark because Muslims in Western Europe are disproportionately more observant. You know, as I mentioned, France is a key example of this. So I think that we are, we are becoming more like that here. And, um, but you know, whether or not that will bring more minorities to the Republican party, I think one obstacle to that is if you have this kind of um, like Josh Hawley populist vibe, you can try to not be racist. And I think sometimes there's a good effort made to not go into overly problematic territory. But what you find with some of this discourse is that if you are a minority, it's still going to be a little bit hard to feel totally comfortable in that scene. So just, you know, sp speaking as a Muslim now, I mean, I can see interesting things about the Republicans when it comes to respecting family and God and stuff like that, but I get the sense that they don't really like me. They're not focusing on my my group as much now, but let's say, God forbid, there's a, there's a terrorist attack on American soil. Um, you can imagine that a Muslim commits, and it's specifically with Islamic motives, then you can see a lot of this discourse coming back of painting um, American Muslims as an internal threat and all of that. And, and I, and my, I mean, my first political memory when I was, well, I guess I sort of remember Clinton, but when I got more into politics was under Bush and my parents vote like many in the American Muslim community voted for George W. Bush in 2000. But then there was a, a, a very stark shift after that. Why? Because after nine 11 Republicans, it, it wasn't with a lot of the talk on the war on terror and civil liberties abuses at home and the Patriot Act. If you were an American Muslim, you started to feel like, oh, 
this is not, the party isn't really defending me. They don't really have my back. So if Republicans aren't able to show that they can actually defend the rights of black people, however you want to define defending the rights of a particular group or to, or to defend the civil liberties of American Muslims, it becomes, they have to get better on that. And I think in a lot of these populist Trump curious circles, there is there you you find racist or bigoted ideas like you don't have to search that long to see some pretty bad rhetoric so that's going to be i think one of the one of the big obstacles but the republican party does have a lot of potential if it actually got serious about this and did it in an intelligent way and actually followed through on it yeah, which is why it's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. No, look, I mean, like, this is something I've been talking about for a long time. My my friend uh, Ramesh Panuru, you know, he used to make this point all the time about how he's like, look, imagine you're a uh, Indian American, uh, obviously, you know, not obviously, but you know, Indian American from an immigrant background, not Christian, and but you're a small businessman, you like low taxes, and you agree on X and Y and Z on other issues for the Republicans and you go to a Republican county meeting and it begins with everyone holding hands saying, um, let us give thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now it's, there's nothing wrong with giving thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, um, he's not my Lord, but you know, you get the <laughs> point. The thing is, is that, um, you, that's not bigoted. It's just not inclusive. It just, it will say, it could send the signal to the guy. This really isn't the kind of club for me. And the GOP has been bad about that kind of stuff for a very long time. I remember it was only like 10 years ago where maybe less than that. It was after the 2012 election that the GOP of Texas said you can no longer hold Republican party meetings at country clubs. Because it just sent a bad signal that, you know, imagine if you're a Hispanic businessman and you want to go to this <laughs> meeting and the only other Hispanic you see is the guy parking your car. It's just, it's bad optics, you know? And my problem is that I think the GOP has gotten much worse about this kind of thing. I mean, I know that people have been calling the GOP racist forever and all that kind of stuff. And I used to work much harder at defending about it. But because of the way Trump has disrupted everything, I think you're absolutely right. When you start to embrace white identity politics, it is inevitable that you are going to send signals deliberately or inadvertently that turn off non-white practitioners, you know, non-white people. And, um, and that's again, part of my point about why both parties seem determined to be minority parties. If the GOP could just not be crazy, I think it could be a majority party. If the, Dem if the Democratic Party could actually look more like Biden sounds, it could be a majority party. But they're both in the grips of these groups that have a zero-sum mentality about politics and think the, the good is the enemy of the perfect and they want the perfect. And that perpetuates the ability for the other party to get in power again. And, um, and that's why every election is now catastrophized as Flight 93, because the idea of the other people running things even for five minutes is terrifying because you've just, you've told your own voters for five years that it's be terrifying. So it's just, it's, it, I think things are going to get worse before they get better. And I don't like saying that, but I think that's, that's the case. Um, you're free to respond to any of these things. Um, but yeah, mm. uh, well, go ahead. Go, if you have any thoughts on that, that's, that's fine with me. And then I want to, I want to change gears just slightly for a second. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to say, I mean, just one thing on the existential tenor of our politics that, that you're pointing you're pointing to right now. Um, and uh, I mean, I remember this. I remember seeing this existential politics and being very frightened of it in the Middle East. And that's, you know, and I draw on those experiences. And I used to think that American politics was a separate kind of category in part because we used to debate things like, I don't know, health care reform and tax policy, like under Obama some of this culture stuff was beginning to intensify, but it still seemed like policy debates were, were there as part of the conversation. But now it's now like, I don't know anyone who voted for Trump because of policy per se, or anyone who was like, 
oh, I voted for Biden because I looked at his proposals on the website and I went in a lot of detail on all these specific issues. And I was like, oh, I think his policies are comparatively better than Trump if I compare them side by side. It's not about that anymore. It's about it's about an existential feeling. I mean, Biden could have said anything in the world, pretty much anything in the world, and I would have voted for him because it wasn't about any particular view or it was just, you know, there's two choices. And it did feel to me, even though I, some people think I'm sympathetic to Trump and attack me for that, I'm willing to understand Trump. And I think that Trump voters are an evil. And that makes me apparently a bad person for being willing to consider them as my fellow Americans. But, you know, I did think that there were foundational questions that were at stake. And, you know, so you you vote accordingly. Let's change gears for just a second here. Um, explain to me the argument of of Islamic exceptionalism. What do you mean by that? How does it relate to American exceptionalism? Yeah, sure. So the basic argument in in that book was, as the title suggests, I was arguing that Islam is fundamentally different than other religions and specifically different than Christianity. But in some ways, you know, you might say, well, all religions are different in different ways. Otherwise, what would be the point of being a believer of one and not the other? But I focus specifically on Islam's relationship to law, politics, and governance, that Islam has played and continues to play an outsized role in public life and politics. And it's proven to be resistant to secularization, even though over the last century, there have been pretty aggressive efforts in different parts of the Muslim majority world to basically cut religion down to size, privatize it to some extent, make it less relevant. But those efforts have failed, even when authoritarian regimes have used very aggressive, coercive means. So, um, and there's a number of reasons I talk about why this might be the case. And um, I mean, one, one quick one, it has to do with the founding moment. I'm not someone who believes that religions can be anything they want to be. They have a creed. So sort of, as you said earlier, there are guardrails, there is dogma. So if you are a Christian, but then you say that you don't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ then you could be culturally Christian, but really from a theological standpoint, you're not Christian in any meaningful sense. I mean, without the idea of of Christ having some divine aspect, and there can be debates about what that means in practice, but then, you know, the the architecture of Christianity falls apart. Um, In Islam, uh, the founding moment was quite different than Christianity insofar as where Jesus was a dissident against a reigning state, Uh, Prophet Muhammad wasn't just a prophet or a cleric or a theologian. He was also a politician and he was also a state builder and a head of a proto-state in Medina. So when, when the Quran is being revealed, it pretty much has to say something about governance. I don't want to overstate how much the Quran says about law and governance. Sometimes people exaggerate that it's not a law book, but there is some public law in it. And it had to be that way because if the early Muslims are trying to govern this proto-state and and God or God is revealing things to them, then there is going to be some account of public law, right? But obviously in, in Christianity, Christians were minorities living under the majority, uh, living under other majorities. So there wasn't actually a major urgency in figuring out how to govern according to Christian ideas. So in that crucial, the crucial early couple centuries of Christianity, there is no conception of public law that is being developed because it wasn't necessary. And so you look at the New Testament and then, you know, obviously Paul is a critical figure in this, but Paul Paul talks about the law, not just as something that isn't part of Christianity. He talks about, um, in Galatians, for example, about how um, the law is a curse, that the law is actually a problem to be solved or avoided. So this becomes a distinctive feature of Christianity. So, I mean, how is that relevant today? Well, I mean, w- one way is that when Christians are trying to figure out how to make Christianity relevant to everyday politics, they don't have as much to draw on. But if you're a Muslim, um, you can, you have the internal resources that are there in the classical Islamic tradition that are there in the founding moment, And if you want to emulate Prophet Muhammad, you can find very obvious things to emulate that are explicitly political. 
So all this has all of this has an impact. Um, and I should clarify when I when I talk about this exceptionalism, I actually don't think it's bad. I don't think it's necessarily always good either. I think. I think a religion playing an outsized role in public life is neutral. It can be good, but it can also be bad. Um, and I think that this instinct that we, that many secular folks have, they hear this idea of Islamic exceptionalism and they sometimes wonder, wait, why is Shadi this, this Muslim writer? Why is he kind of saying these bad things about Islam? But then they're fundamentally misunderstanding the argument. And I think that what makes Islam compelling to a lot of people is, is precisely the fact that it seems relevant to everyday life in a way that perhaps other religions feel less so in that regard, and that it can be relevant to legal debates or questions about governance. So some Muslims like that a lot. I would actually say most Muslims find that to be an appealing part of their religion that gives them a structure at a time when I think a lot of us are looking for structure and coherence. And I think one, this is something I'm trying to develop a little bit more in an essay that I'm working on now, which is not so much how the decline of Christianity has led to bad effects in America, but why Christianity has declined. Why has it become less compelling to people in recent decades? And I think one argument that draws on my book, Islamic Exceptionalism, is that because you have all this political confusion in modern Western democracies, and it's not exactly clear what Christianity has to say about resolving them. And I think in some ways, people are looking for more, as I said, structure and even hierarchy. And, and there is this kind of like uh, minimal movement of converting to Catholicism, of trad Catholics and all of that. And they would argue that they like Catholicism because it does provide more of this hierarchy. And in some ways you can find a version of Catholicism that is more explicitly political. And that's the whole integralist strain of Catholicism mm -hmm. that Adrian Vermeule has been the major exponent of in American debates. That hasn't spread very far, but in, in, in some elite Catholic circles, that's become more compelling because it does help answer some of these foundational political questions that modern Christianity hasn't been very good at addressing or has that tried to avoid um, addressing, particularly um, in the latter part of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, I find the, 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 the integralist Vermeil stuff deeply pernicious and dangerous. Um, and also, as someone who knows a lot about the history of the conservative movement, I find a lot of this stuff annoying because these debates were had in the 1960s and 1970s between National Review and Bozell Sr. and the Triumph magazine. And the, it's, it's sort of like, because these people missed that argument or don't know about these arguments, they, they think that they're making the fresh arguments, which have been actually made many, many times in the past, but we don't need to geek out on, on, on my interconservative gripes. Um, I, I I have, I have two points in response to that. I'd like your thoughts on them. One on the, the, the decline of religion stuff, which is sort of where we started and we didn't really put a bow on it. I'm a big adherent and it's on the remnant podcast bingo card of Yuval Levin's argument about institutions that, yeah, you know, how institutions used to mold us and now we use them as platforms to perform upon. And one of the points that he makes, you know, borrowing from Robert Nisbet, who was a big influ influence on him, is that institutions, one of the benefits, of, while the benefits of institutions give you a sense of community, a sense of belonging, and they mold character and all these kinds of things, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that institutions are meant to do something. They're like a tool to accomplish something. And, um, and I, one of the reasons why I worry about one of the, one of the trends that I think explains part of the lack of religion is that, and there are a lot, I think there are lots of reasons for it, but, um, or the decline of religion is, um, uh, churches have forgotten how to solve specific problems for people. I mean, it used to be the, one of the explanations for religion is, is that the most pressing issue, the ultimate concern in people's lives on a daily basis was death because people were just dying all the time. And so like it provided you an answer about how to provide meaning in this life and what would come for you in the next life. And now we get a lot of that from science 
and um, and technology. And, and that's why I think there are people out there who basically use science and technology as a substitute religion. Um, but more broadly, I just think that the, that churches have forgotten to a certain extent how to be relevant in actually solving people's needs in ways that they once were. And I'm sure there are a thousand exceptions to this, but if you just think about how the role of religion led to you getting a barn in Amish culture, you can kind of see how like religion solved real problems in people's lives. Um, and then the second thing I was going to say is like, I agree with you entirely about how religion can be involved in public life. Whenever I get into arguments with liberals who think we should have a naked public square and they misquote and misunderstand the high wall separation from Jefferson, I was like, you do realize we wouldn't have had an abolition movement or a civil rights movement without <laughs> The black church. I mean, just like wouldn't have happened, you know, without 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 organized religion, not just the black church, because the abolition movement was largely white in the beginning for obvious reasons. Um, and um, uh, and then the third thing, just on the Islamic exceptionalism thing, uh, I, what interests me about that is how you reconcile liberalism. You know, and when I say liberalism, I don't mean progressivism. I mean, you know, so you're, you're right. You're, you're left liberal, but still sort of procedural liberalism, hmm. free speech, limited government, uh, all these kinds of things, uh, uh, freedom of conscience, yada, yada. Uh, how do you reconcile that with, with your understanding of Islam? Because there's a very strong argument that our understanding of liberalism really is born out of, you know, the end of the it comes out of the Westphalian peace where people just got too tired to kill each other over conscience anymore. And, um, has a lot to do with Protestantism. And, and also I would argue goes back to Jesus saying render under Caesar and St. Augustine mm -hmm. with the city of God and the city of man. And there's not, as you point out, that's just not the history of Islam. You know, where the distinction, the Augustinian distinction between city of God and city of man isn't there, or at least as to my understanding, isn't mm -hmm. there in the same way. So what is the Islamic argument for classical liberalism as you understand it? Or why is it okay? Why is it compatible with Islam? Yeah, well, so like historically in Islam, you could have separation of mosque and state to some, to some degree. And it's always important to distinguish separation of church and state or mosque and state from separation of religion from politics. So mm -hmm. Islam can have the former and has had the former because clerics have historically played a different role in, in Islamic caliphates, that there was a kind of inherent, maybe not sep separation per se, but the clerical class had some autonomy from the executive authority, the Sultan or the Caliph. Um, yeah, but on, on the broader question, so I would say that um, Islam as it's currently understood and, has, and as it has been understood, is in tension with classical liberalism. I don't necessarily see that as the worst thing in the world because I don't believe that everyone has to become liberal. I think there are different conceptions of the good life and liberalism in some sense can, can provide its own ideological structure. And people sometimes like to pretend that liberalism, classical liberalism is neutral, but actually it's only neutral to those who are already liberal. Um, and, and so I think there can be a kind of a pluralism of different conceptions of the good life. I, I do think that Islam can be, and actually is compatible with small D democracy. And to me, that's the mo the more important question. And I'm generally someone who priority when they're in tension, I prioritize small D democracy over small L liberalism, mm -hmm. because I think it's very difficult, um, for us as Americans to look at other parts of the world and say, let's think how more Muslims can be encouraged to be liberal. I, I think that leads to a number of problems, but it can also lead to coercion where we support authoritarian regimes that seem more progressive or liberal or open-minded, but they basically repress their own people in the name of being better on women's rights or minority rights. And we kind of fall into that trap and we like that kind of language, so on and so forth. And I think the, one of the fundamental aspects of human dignity is that 
individuals have the right to have some control over their own destiny and preferably to choose some of their own representatives. And then at some level, we have to kind of take a step back as Americans and say, well, this is the choice people made. And it's not just in the Muslim in Muslim majority countries where people choose badly in quotation marks when they vote. What we're learning is that whether it's in India with Modi or Duterte in the Philippines, Israel with the far right, or, or um, Brazil with Bolsonaro, or even us with Donald Trump, what we found out when people are given the right to vote, even in pretty established democracies, they can make choices that seem personally threatening to a lot of citizens. And I don't think our response should be, well, we have to force them to have the right ideas or force them to kind of embrace classical liberalism. Because clearly in India today, um, the Hindu, I mean, the Hindu majority um, is not necessarily um, totally gung ho on classical liberalism right now. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, should we really be arguing that um, the people should reject an outcome where a Hindu right wing nationalist is elected? So that's sort of how I would conceptualize that. Um, I think what's what's special about Islam in America is that it's it's one of the places where there's an ongoing experiment where liberalism and Islam are interacting in really fascinating ways and where more and more American Muslims have found a kind of compatibility. And I think part of that is simply because the power of the American idea, and I think some Muslim conservatives here in America are grumbling about this. They see this power and um, how compelling uh, American liberalism is, or at least has been, and they see how a younger generation of American Muslims are losing some of their orthodoxy. So one example is that on, on gay marriage, again, a kind of interesting proxy proxy example, that there's a Pew poll where in 2007, 52% of American Muslims believed that um, homosexuality was not morally acceptable. Mm -hmm. The number in just 10 years, so in the 2017 Pew poll, it went down to 27%. So only now 27% of American Muslims consider homosexuality to be whatever. There was a particular phrase that was something like morally unacceptable or, or, or along mm -hmm. those lines, but the point holds. And, and I think that makes people really nervous and, you know, we're having new interpretations. And one of my, uh, one of my good friends, Mustafa Akul has a new book that just, I, I believe came out this week on re it's called reopening the Muslim mind where he makes a very, kind of like his definitive case for the compatibility between Islam and, and liberalism. I don't think he would have been able to write that book um, in most Middle Eastern countries, or he would have written it, but no one would have really cared and it wouldn't have gained mm -hmm. traction. So I, I do think, so there is perhaps, there is Islamic exceptionalism in my view, but I think America provides its own, its own unique laboratory for seeing how religions evolve and we don't see that in Western Europe. If anything, in Western European countries, we see younger generations becoming more strict and more conservative than their immigrant parents. And that's a whole story on its own of why that might be the case. But we don't see that same kind of integration, even in other advanced Western democracies. All right. So I guess what I'm getting is like in the American political context, I, I've never been a voluptuary of just pure democracy. Um, it, it, it goes towards my um, problems with populism. You know, I mean, I like the Senate. I like the filibuster. I'm okay with the electoral college. Um, doesn't mean I'm against people voting. I want to live in a place that has democratic mechanisms in it. Um, but forced to choose between living in a liberal society and a democratic society, as if those are half, if I had to make that Hobson's choice, I'd, I'd err on the side of the liberal society because in my view, pure democracy is just the proposition that says 51% of the people can pee in the cornflakes of 49% of the people. Um, I like that we have a bill of rights that constrains what majorities can do. I like that we have a Supreme court that enforces a bill of rights that constrains what they can do. And so I think it's, it's, and so it seems to me that the solution that you're talking about, uh, allowing, cause I believe I agree. I think I agree with you that for a liberal society or a democratic society, society to survive and thrive, 
you need undemocratic institutions. You need institutions that have a little stickiness that can impose values that are beyond the base minimum of mere liberalism. And that goes for religion. It goes for the Boy Scouts. It goes for all sorts of things. And as long as you have the right to exit, they can be as strict as they want to be, right? There's nothing saying that the Amish have to live the way they do, but they choose to do that. And they have very strict rules internally. And people can leave that community if they want, but they don't have to if, if they want to submit themselves to it. And so isn't the answer to all of this not so much democracy over liberalism, but federalism or subsidiarity that allows different communities to live the way they want to live according to their rules? And as long as those communities don't impose those values on other communities or on the nation writ large, then that's the way to actually maximize human happiness and human flourishing. So, so I actually agree with that um, to a large degree. Um, if there if there is a solution that we're looking for, I think it would be more um, localism or subsidiarity over liberalism per se, and and federalism just more broadly. I am suspicious of nation states that centralize power because I think what that does it raises the stakes too high on national elections. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we look at the Middle East, elections became quite existential because this was the prize that everyone was capturing. Whoever had the machinery of the state would then be able to remake state and then perhaps society in their own image. So the question for me in a lot of these debates about how we live with deep difference and deep divide. So in our country, we have a variety of deep divides in, in the Arab world. It's usually along Islamist secular lines over the role of religion in everyday life and Islam in the state. And these people have to learn to live together. So Islamists will never conclusively defeat non-Islamists and then vice versa. So then federalism and weakening the central state to some degree and distributing more power to local or regional governments I think in, in many ways that applies to a lot of different kinds of societies and, and democracies. So I certainly agree there. I do worry about intertwining some of these good ideas on localism with, with liberal, I mean, liberalism, again, it depends what it actually means in practice. I think one concern that more and more Republicans, and you, you can correct me if, if you think it's a little bit different on this, that Republicans have seen a situation or conservatives more generally in the US where liberalism keeps on asking more for itself that in theory we're supposed to be classically liberal but then over time liberalism has this way of expanding or at least its practitioners start to see it in a more expansive light and I guess this is um, not just a Mule argument, but also the Patrick Deneen argument, the Rod Dreher argument that liberalism cannot be contained as classical because we have a very powerful state in, in the modern context. So naturally, liberal elites um, become more powerful. They have more influence within bureaucratic structures, so on and so forth. So I think that Putting aside how this stuff plays out, a coercive secularization or liberalism in the Middle East, it also seems to be an issue that more and more Republicans and conservatives seem to be worried about, that um, how do we go back to classical liberalism when there don't seem to be a lot of classical liberals yet? I mean, on both sides, we see people who have expansive conceptions of the state and what the state should do on questions of culture. Yeah, I, look, I mean, I, I have... You know, uh, I have really profound disagreements and and agreements with Patrick Deneen on some of this stuff, and I, we've talked. I've talked with him about it quite a bit, and 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 same thing with Rod. Uh, you know, and I'm old friends with Rod of Rods, but um, I think a lot of the analysis, like uh, uh, let me put it this way, a lot of Patrick's solutions, I agree with because he actually agrees with me about the subsidiarity at thing, the end. Right? Yeah, 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 because it lets people live the way they want to live, and. Um, and lets a thousand flowers bloom. And I'm all in favor of keeping Austin weird. And I'm all in favor of letting Amish people be Amish. And if people want to live in a majority Muslim community in Dearborn or whatever, and have all sorts of rules that are simpatico with th that culture and that faith, uh, you know, 
you can't go too far with it, but you can't go too far with anything. And, but beyond that, if, you know, if, if some, some town wants to ban alcohol, so be it. What bothers me is this idea of elites coming in, whether they're liberal elites, whether you call them liberal elites or conservative elites or whatever, and imposing their vision on the entire country. Cause it's just too big a country. It's too diverse a country to do that. And it's going to make a lot of people miserable I guess where I kind of disagree with you is, and with with Deneen is, I, I I don't believe that you know all of our problems are attributable to John Locke. I don't think that you know that our that the liberalism we have operates like some sort of cancer cell. Um, and I think that the the liberal elites that are in power really aren't all that liberal. I mean, we would talk. We began this conversation talking about wokeism. It's not liberal. And the meritocracy is not particularly liberal. The meritocracy is all about sort of uh, pulling the gangplank up from behind them after they've reached their plateau of the meritocracy. And, um, uh, you know, this is stuff that Adam Smith gets into and, 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 and others about how people are conspiring against the public good by closing off avenues of success. Um, and, uh, and what I want to live in, in, you know, I think one of the reasons why our politics become, become become so catastrophized, and you know, getting to the stuff that you were you were writing about in the Atlantic, about the sort of Erzat's religious war in the country, um, is because there is this sense that if the other side's leaders get in charge, they're going to screw with my way of life, and some of it is paranoid hyperbole, and some of it's really, really real, and the way you fix that is by lowering the stakes of national elections, by lowering the relevance of the Supreme Court and deciding public policy questions and pushing as much power and decision making down to the most local, local level possible. As American dogma, you can't have slavery, you can't have Jim Crow, right? Um, I, and, uh, but beyond those kinds of first order kind of things, if some towns want to live like the set of Footloose, so be it. If some towns want to have their freak flag fly, so be it. And so I, the reason I bring this up is my problem with democracy as the, as the ultimate arbiter of these things is that it, it, if, 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 if at the margins, every time you're going to opt to side with democracy over liberalism, you are actually, I would argue you're setting the preconditions for, uh, tyrannical majorities to actually screw with the way people live more than liberalism proper properly understood does does that make sense yeah it does but i mean at some point if there's an impasse on two conflicting visions and the constitution doesn't speak to one resolution or another at some point it has to be resolved through a democratic process because you're i mean uh i mean let's say the supreme court is just simply it's not germane to their their jurisdiction or um, it's not it's not being considered by the Supreme Court. Um, you know, at some point, one side or another is going to feel like whoever win whoever wins, whether it's a congressional vote or a, or a national election, is imposing a way of life on them because so much our identities are so intertwined now with politics that it's hard to see situations where were not personally, uh, you know, affected. I think, and then there's also a question of what's an imposition, because I, I think that many conservative Christians would say the fact that abortion is not banned is an imposition on their way of life. I mean, I think that doesn't make any sense because they can still choose to not have abortions. Um, but there is a kind of religious sensibility that expands the question of, what is being imposed it's not just what's being imposed on one's self or one's body but what's being imposed on one's broader conception of politics or their broader community and that's why abortion is you know obviously such a hot button issue because both sides feel that the other is trying to impose their particular conception of good life on the other so there are just some things that can't really be resolved in 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 an obvious way through liberalism or through subsidiarity or through uh, returning to the constitution and what the constitution says. Yeah, I, 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 think you, that's, yeah. No, I think that's right. I think my problem with that 
response, which is a perfectly intellectually defensible response, is it starts at the wrong end of the spectrum. Uh, why not start with the idea that residents of Portland, Oregon should be allowed to purchase unpasteurized stinky cheese without the FDA approving it, right? I mean, the, the Tocqueville talks about this, about how like it's more oppressive to live in a society that nickels and dimes you. Obviously, this is a paraphrase that nickels and dimes you on the little things in life um, than one that that imposes things on the fundamental questions, right? I mean, abortion, the reason why abortion is so hard is because it gets to fundamental questions about what is a human and ensoulment and the role of the state and who, why should the state decide who's a human being and who's not. Um, same thing with like issues of the draft. You know, it's like, what, am I a servant of the state? You know, there are those kinds of questions. Those are always going to be hard to figure out because they're important and they're difficult. But if you sent power down on the 80, 90% of questions that have nothing to do with like grand metaphysical crises and have to do with things like what the minimum wage should be, or, you know, uh, or even questions of local censorship, although that's a much harder thing now because of the internet, um, you can come up with all sorts of things about just how people live their lives that the federal government should not be involved in. And so that when people say, oh, the powers that be are screwing with me, they're talking about their local community leaders or their state leaders. And the advantages of that is that when it's the local people, you know who to fire, you know who to hold democratically yeah. accountable. And the problem with doing it, everything at the federal level is that there's, there's, there's this sense that these unseen forces are controlling your life. I'd rather have someone named Ted or Sue or, you know, or, 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 or Shadi can trying to control my life at the local level. And then I can have an argument with them face to face. Then this idea that we're just voting for two coalitions, we're going to run a continental nation of 330 million people from far away. And I think that's how you get populism is this sense that we're all, every, both sides are, are so dominated by populists because they feel like the people controlling the important questions of their lives are far away from them, make them closer to home. And then you know, like, you actually have robust democracy where you winners look losers in the eye and actually debate things. Yeah. But then you have issues where cer certain um, localities or states are basically one party. So you don't have the same dynamics of self-correction that you might ideally want to have in a democracy. So if you're a liberal, who's stuck in, I don't know, Wyoming, uh, you're pretty much stuck with one party. And even if that one party, you know, messes up, messes with your life, you don't have a lot of recourse. If you're in New York, New York City, and you're one of the few Republicans who live in Manhattan, you know, you're probably not going to have a Republican representative on the local level. Um, I, I don't know. I, and, but we do, I mean, I guess it's a bigger conversation, but I mean, we do have quite a bit more state and local jurisdiction than other Western democracies do. So sure. if we look at it as, as a spectrum, I mean, we're still doing relatively good. And one can look at our COVID response and say, well, um, Trump and, you know, even now Biden, there is considerable delegation of authority to um, localities and states in terms of how they want to deal with a world historical pandemic. And I know we can debate whether or not that's worked out well or not. And with a more nationalized response have worked better, maybe not, un maybe under Trump, if not necessarily under Biden, people can debate that. But, you know, there, there are things, there are things that do affect people on a very fundamental level, like how they live during a pandemic. And do they want their weird governor who has like crazy views on this to be the one deciding that for them and they have no way of getting, I, I don't know. It's just. No, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. And there are going to be problems with any system because we live in a flawed yeah, world yeah. and the, the perfect worlds of the next life, not in this one, but I'd rather have one crazy governor screwing up one state than one crazy president. That's true. Screwing up the whole country. I mean, that, that's sort of the point is that you can, it's sort of like you can compartmentalize bad problems and you can illuminate and have as a, uh, uh, model of good behavior, good, good governance in places. I mean, that's the way the whole laboratories of democracy thing is properly understood. It's not actually what Brandeis meant, but, uh, is supposed to be understood. And, um, it just contains problems better. It's like having like 
firewalls that shut down at a, at a power plant so that you can contain badness um, and and deal with it. And as long as you have the right to exit, move. I mean, this is one of the things that drives me crazy about a lot of people who say, you know, uh, they're they're oppressed in because they live in X or Y state. It's the most mobile society at the most mobile time in all of human history. And if you don't want to have arguments at the local level and, and duke it out and, and have to like, and take your citizenship, citizenship seriously at the local level, which you don't have to do. You can just also just live your life. If you want move, move someplace where people agree with you and live the way that you want to live. And, and, you'll be happier. The people that you're annoying will be happier. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and it's, I mean, I used to, I do this for college students. Federalism is the best, I argue is the best system ever conceived of for maximizing human happiness because it just lets the most people live the way they want to live. Um, assuming that you don't allow for tyrannical evil, you know, illiberal stuff. It's, it's the best way to go. But anyway, I'm, I'm boring you with my obsessions rather than illuminating your obsessions. And I apologize for that. So, no, I like those um, issues too. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Shady, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, uh, thanks love to so have much. You back. Yeah. Yeah. I really fun. enjoyed this Jonah. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And, um, people can, uh, find, uh, Wisdom of Crowds, uh, not the Wisdom of Crowds, the important branding <laughs> uh, uh, issue there. Um, and I was actually asking you this. I might as well ask you now. So what is your inspiration for the title Wisdom of Crowds? Is it this democracy, Uber Alice stuff that you were talking about? Or is it is it Francis Galton? What is it? Yeah, so... I mean, on, on the podcast, but also we're now um, also a website and a newsletter. Um, and you can just find us on wisdomofcrowds.live for anyone who's interested. But um, pretty much in everything that we do, either written or on the podcast, we are, we're focused on questions of democracy, representation, populism, and what are the limits of populism? Is it a good idea? And that gets us to a fundamental question of do we like the crowds making decisions or, and I'm also, I should say, I'm a low level misanthrope. So I'm in this, I'm in an odd position of not loving people all that much, but also being very much a proponent of small D democracy. So we often sort of explore that tension. Can someone who thinks people suck or that people's tastes, I mean, I, a popular culture and mm -hmm. things that people talk about on Twitter or Facebook, I mean, a lot of that stuff isn't particularly appealing to me, but then democracy means that we trust these people who have like bad taste in music and listen to some like, I don't know, pops. I don't know who the pop stars are who are popular these days. Pick one. So it's just, you know, it's an interesting tension there, at least for me. Um, you know, it's funny. In another age, you could have been... Uh closer to a sort of a national review conservative, you know, in the sense that, <laughs> no, I, I mean that seriously. I mean, there, there is, there used to be this or, or not even a national review conservative. I mean, there were, there were true socialists back in the day, you know, I mean, the Irving Howe crowd, uh, who were cultural sophisticates who really hated sort of vulgarian popular culture, who at the same time <laughs> loved democracy and loved egalitarianism. And I miss the, the the world where that kind of stuff was allowed. I mean, the guy from whom the, this podcast is partially named, this Albert J. Knock guy, who I didn't subscribe to all his views about everything, but um, there was this weird sub. You know, I was at National Review for twenty years. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this weird subculture on the right of Austro-Hungarian Empire loving uh, dudes who wear capes, and. Um, that's one of the things I admit, I, I, I'm with you about the homogenizing nature of liberalism. I think it has as much to do with democracy as liberalism, but whatever that hom the homogenizing nature of democracy or modernism that Deneen talks about bothers me too. I want more weird people with weird non-conformist tastes yeah. and things. And so I'm, and I'm also a low level misanthrope as well, which is why I've thrived during the pandemic because what <laughs> used to be considered socially uh you know anti-social habits of mine are now considered like responsible behavior so there's that i mean you seem social um, i've never met you in real life but hopefully one day i fake it really well i, I will <laughs> spend the, i'll spend the next three hours hugging my knees in the shower because of all of my exposure to humanity here but uh 
Um, <sighs> anyway, uh, Shadi Amid, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really thank appreciate you, it. Hope to have you back on sometime, and we can argue about democracy more. And of course, yeah. death to death to Brookings. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Don't know if I agree with that last part, but thanks again, Jonah, for having me. My pleasure. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Okay. So Shadi has uh, left the studio and um, I thought that was interesting. There was a lot of stuff I'm going to have to noodle on and there's going to be a certain esprit d'escalier um, uh, going on, which is, of course, French for damn. Why didn't I say that? Um, uh and also, like some of the, I, I've been writing and thinking about this, relig- particularly this political religion stuff, so long that um, maybe I just need to do a solo remnant on it because I have such, just wh- whether I'm right or wrong, such developed views about this stuff, and I keep wanting to intrude it, um, which I kind of did on the Dispatch podcast on Wednesday. Um, David was asking, you know, was was we were talking about the decline of religion, and all of a sudden I got into the weeds really quickly on evolutionary psychology and whatnot, which is probably not what we were looking for in, in, in rank punditry. Um, but anyway, I thought it was an interesting discussion and I hope you guys like it. Let me know what you think. And, um, we are just so you guys know, we are going to try and change the schedule of the solo remnants. Um, this mostly has to do with, um, the, tyrannical tyrannical hegemony of caleb parker our um leader of all things podcasts in terms of it's easier for them if i record it in the morning on fridays before i write the g file rather than record it at five or six in the evening on a friday um because apparently some people think that they deserve recreation on weekends i it's weird but whatever i mean whatever floats your boat um, so, uh, I have no idea how that will change the, um, the idiosyncratic nature of the most idiosyncratic of things I do, which is the very weird rambling into a microphone alone in a room. Um, and we'll actually have somebody listening now taking show notes. So that's going to be even stranger. Um, but I don't know why any of you would care about any of this. So I'll stop talking about it. Um, so, uh, please, if you can, you know, I don't ask this all the time anymore because I, I now having seen, um, the, the corruption of the rating system of various podcast platforms up close. Um, I no longer think it means as much in terms of my own self-esteem, but it does help with marketing. So if you can give us a good review uh, at Apple or Stitcher or, uh, wherever, wonderful podcasts can be found um that would be wonderful and if you don't want to give us a good review send me an email but you know spare imposing your your unfair um um aspersions um on the on the public at large and if you haven't subscribed to the dispatch yet uh it would really be wonderful if you could um if everybody who listened to this podcast were actually a paid subscriber to the dispatch um we would bestride this earth as a colossus we would be the um, Mobutu Sesti Seiko, um, Kwaza Nabanga. I can't remember the rest of it, but that translates, Mobutu's full name translated into roughly the all powerful rooster who leaves um, fire in his wake. Um, we would be that um, of digital media platforms, and we would really appreciate it. And um, other than that, I'll, uh, I'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast.